That's okay. So um, thank you everyone for attending this session. I really appreciate um, uh, seeing you all sort of. Um, and so the first question is, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Can you sort of nod your head? Okay, this is good. Um, if at some point you cannot, please let me know because I don't know, you know, half the time I discover that I have done something and covered up my microphone or something. So um, please alert me if um, uh, I am not audible. And if, um, so Jonathan, you're gonna be around the whole session. Is that correct? That's so correct. Jonathan, if you and Kirsten could be looking at the chat. Is chat available here? Okay, if you could look at the it chat. Is. And uh, let me know if somebody has said something. I'd appreciate that. So I want to um, thank a couple people first before I go forward. One of them is Jonathan Young, who is doing tech assistance for this session. He is a DPhil student in theology and religion at Oxford Mansfield College, um, but more personally relevant to me, he has an MA in classics from the University of Iowa, where I got my PhD. And next is Kirsten Day. So Kirsten is a colleague of mine in the world of liberal arts colleges in Western Illinois. And she was gracious enough to do this introduction for me because I am the only person on the ticket. And so it just felt kind of weird in my own introduction. Um, so notice that I have her identified as professor and chair. That's not just being sloppy. That's, that's because she's actually earned that. You know, as of this fall, she's no longer associate. She's no longer assistant. She is professor Kirsten Day. So with that, I will turn things over to her, Kirsten. Bob, you know it hasn't been confirmed by the board yet, and you're jinxing me. <laughs> oh, I'm so sorry. Oh, no. Okay. No, oh, that's fine. fine. Hopefully it's pro forma as usual, but all bets are off in this apocalyptic world we're in right now. So. Yeah. <laughs> um, thank you so much for inviting me to do this for you. I'm just thrilled to be here, um, and I'll get right to it. Um, Dr. Simmons is the Minnie Billings Capron Chair of Classical Languages and the Associate Professor and Co-Chair of the Department of Classics at Monmouth College. He earned a BA in English and Classics from St. John's University and an MIT in English from Minnesota State Mankato and a PhD in Classics from the University of Iowa, as he just alluded to. His first book now under contract with Bloomsbury is entitled Demagogues, Power and Friendship in Classical Athens, Leaders as Friends in Aristophanes, Euripides and Xenophon. And today's workshop is derived from work he's done on Classics Days festivals for people of all ages that he has put on eight times over the past decade at Monmouth and before that at UNC Greensboro. My students and I, as uh, Bob just mentioned, are lucky enough uh, to be in a close by institution and we've participated in recent years and I can tell you from experience, uh, these are truly amazing events. Uh, for these festivals and related demonstrations at IJCL conventions and the like, he has won three outreach prizes from CAMWAS and he is the winner of this year's SES outreach prize to which I say without reservation, well deserved. Thanks. He has also taught the ancient Greek Olympics as part of classes of different sorts to students from as young as second grade to his oldest college. And he's also had Olympic themed birthday parties for his kids when they were in preschool that made him for those hours, the coolest dad in his kids classes. <laughs> I was fortunate enough to get a taste of Bob's demonstrations at last year's Illinois Classical Caucus, which my own Augustina College hosted. And I will tell you that we are all in for a real treat today. So a couple of notes on procedural matters. I apologize, I had trouble getting in. So if I'm repeating what uh, Bob said, please forgive me. Um, please do keep your microphone off when you're not speaking. Dr. Simmons will be happy to take questions at the end of the presentation, and I invite you to send them to me via chat, and it sounds like to Jonathan as well, um, so that we can uh, facilitate the Q&A officially, or so that I can in this uh, virtual format. And now, without further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Bob Simmons. Uh, thank you, Associate Professor <laughs> Day. <laughs> Um, so uh, goals for this session, I will let you um, read them on the screen. Uh, what, what you should know is that this is a very much a how-to session. This is, this is not uh, polemical in any way. This, um, if, if your institution is anything like mine, um, classics is not a given and it needs to be fought for and justified um, nearly perpetually. As my Dean recently said to me in a moment of candor that I appreciated, Nobody wants classics, <laughs> but every time somebody comes after you, you bat them away, you know? And so th this is one of the ways that we bat away assailants of classics at, at Monmouth College. Um, we do crap loads of outreach. 
um, you know, all around the state and region and, you know, on our campus. And we do things to make our classes interesting. So um, capitalizing on the, the modern Olympics is one of the ways that uh, we bat away <laughs> some of these assailants. So we offer sports in Greece and Rome classes um, wh whenever there's an Olympics and, th and then also the, the two years in between as well. Um, and we tie the, the sports classes into our classics days. And so students in the sports classes then uh, do events at classics day and they, they teach people how to do them. It becomes kind of a, um, a powerful, um, uh, there's an expression I'm looking for, deep learning experience or something like that, whatever it is, authentic learning. It's, 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 um, so it's, it's a powerful way to uh, do things. So I'm going to tell you about how we do some of the things uh, in the sports classes I teach and in demonstrations that I do, and then um, lay out some ways to get funding for these things. Um, please note that I have a handout that has bibliography for um, all of the events that I will talk about. So there's you know, the, the um, the brief mentioned with each of the events, and then there's a full bibliography at the end. There are a few works that are particularly accessible. Um, so if you are not thoroughly immersed in the world of ancient sport, I would recommend going to those ones first to try to get your, your feet wet in these things and then move on to others. Um, so, uh, and a little bit more background. This is a rather unusual SCS session. It is only I for the next, whatever, 90 to 120 minutes. Um, so there will be no obvious transitions unless I have to go to the bathroom, <laughs> in which case, please pardon me and we'll take a break. Um, and uh, please do ask questions along the way because um, it's, it's gonna break this thing up. I mean, when I've, I've, I've done sessions like this roughly 1 million times before, but only twice before have they been online. And um, one of those was recorded, so there's no opportunity for questions. The other was with a bunch of undergraduates in a 50 minute session. So um, please, please, please interject with questions so that, that it's not just me uh, rambling on for all this time. So um, please uh, jump in and uh, Kirsten and Jonathan, if you can let me know if people have uh, gone into the chat, I'd appreciate that. Um, so I have managed to accumulate tons and tons of materials for doing things like Classics Day. If you, you can look behind my head to see <laughs> various shields and you know, a shield and a bunch of helmets. If you look to my left to see a bunch of, of spears over here and some Roman shields. And I've got a ton of Olympic equipment, but unfortunately I am here in my office in Monmouth and you are all wherever you are. So um, we, we can't do things quite as hands-on as uh, I would have done if uh, this were not a virtual session, but if you wouldn't mind indulging me periodically when I encourage you to try events as you were doing them, um, you know, that would, would uh, please me and it might actually teach you a little something too. So um, without further ado, let me uh, keep rolling with, with this. So what I'll do today is lay out these different events and ways to do them. So a little bit of background on each one and then ways that one can acquire materials for doing them in, you know, at different po price points and for different groups. I've given the, the Greek form of each of these because I only ever see these uh, transliterated, you know? So when I'm looking in books on uh, the Olympics, they only show up transliterated. So um, I actually looked up all the Greek for you people so that uh, you uh, could copy and paste this stuff. Um, so my, my PowerPoint is linked to the, the session. Um, and with that, let us go. So I'm gonna, going to uh, go through each of these events and uh, talk about how they are done. Any questions before I roll into uh, the running events to start? All right, here goes. So running events, I mean, for some of you, this, this may all be self-evident, but for those who are not, I'm going to, to go over just some of the timeline of these things. So the, the Stadion is a race that was just from one end of a stadium to the other. And so when the Olympics began in 776 BCE, it had a total of one athletic event, and that was the, the Stade race, the Stadion race. And, you know, and this was worth people like walking for two weeks to come to because, you know, why not? Um, it's it was a lot of people getting together. Um, and so all it really took was one running race and then, you know, plus other festivities that went along 
um, with that. And then that was good enough for 52 freaking years. And then somebody thought like, maybe we should like expand the athletic events. And so someone's brilliant idea was not just run to from one end to another, but, but run from one end to the other and back, you know? So this is how, this is <laughs> the, the brilliant Greek uh, uh, innovative thinking. So the Stadion is a race from one end of the stadium and back about 192 meters at the Olympic stadium, different lengths at, at different stadiums. And then the Dialos is just that, that same um, race except one end and back. So these are the equivalents of the, the modern 200 and 400 meter races. Then four years after the Diablos, the, the distance running uh, voting block got, got into the action and said, what, what's, how come the, the thin people don't get any races? And so then um, the, the Dolikos is a 20 to 24 length race. And so this is the closest equivalent of an Olympic 5,000 meter run right now. And then the last of them is the Hoplito Dromos that took 200 more years to be introduced I'll talk about these all individually, but the Hoplito Dromos is a race in armor for those who are not familiar with it. And when I get to talking about the Hoplito Dromos, um, we'll see what that armor is. Okay. Any other questions for the moment before we get into a little bit more about beginning of races? All right. Then um, a few more race terms. So if you are going to, to have your um, sports class in which you're achieving the Olympics, or if you're doing your outreach event um, to capitalize on the Olympics, having a few more terms might be useful. So we've got the opposis, which is the, the name for the start, but also just kind of the general starting area. And we have the bulbis, which is the starting block. You can see that on the screen there. It's got the, the two grooves along there, if you can see my um, red pen writing on there. So this is where people's feet would go. I'll talk about that shortly. There was a Husplex system for holding people in place before the race um, began. And this was a very sophisticated system. So um, there would be um, blocks on each end of the um, bulbis that held rope. And then actually all the way along here, we have these um, uh, different posts that would um, separate the runners, and then they had a rope system holding them in place. Then when the starter gave them the commands for starting the race, and these are um, poda, pra, poda, um, foot beside foot, then hitoimoi, ready, and then apita. So at that point then, the starter would release the shish plaques. And so then the rope system would fall down and the runners would vault forward at that point. So a person can't do like a, a, a Ben Johnson style kind of false start that's still sort of legal. You know, if anybody remembers the, the 80s Olympics. So th there were sprinters that had their ways of like doing little kind of false starts to, to get a, a small edge. Um, one could not do that in the ancient Olympics. So um, so there was that, this, this Husplex system. I have not set up one myself because um, I haven't gone quite that complex. But then a few other quick terms. Um, if you're going to be running a Diaulos or longer, there's the Compter, which is the turning post. And then uh, our term for the finish line is the Terma. And then Alutas, I, I call it a judge here. It's more kind of a bouncer. Um, so I'll explain that uh, shortly. So this is our, these are our terms. Uh, now, so the ball bis. So this is from the Olympic Stadium. It's about six inches from the back of uh, the, the back groove to the back of the front groove. And it is there where, where the runners would put their toes. So everybody's running um, uh, cer certainly barefooted and for the men it's bare everything else too. But um, so they got their feet in these grooves here. And I'll talk about um, how this is, you know, how, what they would do then when the feet are in the grooves uh, shortly. But this is how they would go. So the, the stretch is rather long. Uh, I think it's estimated that 20 runners could start these races going across. Um, and they'd all have their toes in the bulbous. Then when runners would start the race, it would look like this. And so we have all sorts of vase paintings of people like um, this guy over here. 
um, with his feet, as you can see, strangely close together. And so these are uh, my three youngest kids. This is Mark, who is uh, just turned 12. This is David, who's 13. This is Alex, who's 12. So these two are twins. Um, so they're illustrating these things. And so notice they've got their feet um, roughly the, the back foot about six inches further back than the front one. You know, the shoulder width apart roughly, but um, six inches separating the, the front toe from the, the back, the, the, the toe at the front foot from the toe at the back foot. And if, if I had gotten a bulbous, a bulbous yet, um, I would have them with their toes in that. This is one of the things I still have to work on. Um, it turns out that marble is really, really expensive. And so, like, you know, trying to get, you know, marble um, into which I could carve these grooves is um, not the simplest of things. And it's also extraordinarily heavy and fragile so that if I, you know, moving it around and then dropping it is just complicated. So I've looked into wood, but strangely, even thick wood that's four feet wide is, is pretty expensive also. So, but this is one of the ways that I might like to advance Classics Day, but it just, where do I store these things? I don't know. But anyway, so I have these children here illustrating this. So they've got their, their toes, one, the, the feet parallel with one front of one uh, foot about six inches back from the front of the other. Notice their arms are just sticking straight out in front of them. Somebody thought this was a good idea. And so they, they went with it this way. We see all sorts of uh, pictures of people um, starting races like this. So there they are. And then we have the runners heading off as I'm, I'm sure that all of you knew the, the men who competed in the Olympics did so naked. And so um, there they are heading down the course. The women who ran the Haraya race, so the young women who ran the, who took part in the, the Stadion race in the Haraya um, had a, 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 a tunic, a short tunic with um, a one shoulder strap. So I'm going to have the runners starting in response to commands here. So you can see how this might look and I'll hope that this link actually works. And you should have these links on the, um, on the PowerPoint that I posted. So here we go. Hoda para poda. Heto moi. Abete. All right. Hoda para poda. Um, please raise your hand if you could actually hear them, hear what I said. All right, this is very good. Okay, very good. Um, so that was the them starting in response to the command. So the, it's the. Uh, Poda para poda is a foot beside foot, and then hetoimoi ready, and then apita. Then, so if they were doing the stadion, just racing from one end of the, the course to the other, they, that would be it. They just head off, they'd go to the finish line, the, the terma. But if they're doing the, the diaulos or the dolikos or the um, hopefully dromos, they would go around a turn at least once. And so it would, so this would be a copter. And so here's an illustration of runners going around a copter. And while you find that someone um, has asked about the video, it seems like we could hear it, but couldn't see anything. David is our human copter. Here, but cannot see. And here are the runners All right. coming down for- Can you see anything now? The Diaulos. No. Or Dolopos. David okay. is our human compter. Um, any, Jonathan, any ideas for how I might do this? You probably have to do a separate screen share for the video itself, because right now we're just seeing your PowerPoint. Okay, thank so, you for yes. letting me know this early is, on. So, yes, is, is the video embedded in the, in the PowerPoint? Um, the links are embedded in the PowerPoint, but no, okay, the video- Okay, so what you'll have to do is, is um, do a, um, screen share, a new screen share of the screen instead of I the, um, not just the PowerPoint. Okay, so I just, I stopped the share there and I'm gonna go and try to do another. Okay, I'm gonna see and then others if, are asking if, if perhaps you could just send the links to us. Um, they should be on the PowerPoint the, okay, there. that I have posted. Okay. And so now can you see my screen? Yes, we can. 
Okay, this is good. All right, so um, so here are my um, runners coming around the comp tear. And here are the runners coming down for the Diolos or Dolicos. David is our human comp tear. All right, so we've got that. And um, I think I'm just, for the, for the sake of time, I'm not gonna go through the, the feet um, into the start of the race again. Um, let's see, so stop that share. And then, so this is how the race would look. And so now I can't see anybody. Hold on a second. All right, so here I am again, and I'm gonna to try to share my screen better this time. Okay, here we are. Okay, and then, um, so if a runner tries to cut the course, We've got an alutas. We, we can't have people um, actually false starting because the Husplex holds them in place. Um, but if a runner cuts the course, it would look something like this. So we'll once again, stop one share and move to another. Okay. Can you see this? See my, all right. Okay, so we'll see. David again is our human comp tear. Mark is our Aluthas, our judge with his staff. Alex is a Dialos runner who will cut the course. Apita? So um, what we have there so I'll stop my share again. And here are the runners. You should be able to switch without stopping the share. If you just hit the screen, sh the share screen button again, it'll oh, give you. you an option of all the things you can switch to. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. All right. So share screen again and back to here. All right. Thank you. So, um, what does one use for one of these staffs to, to beat somebody? So like I, this is a, a three quarter inch, six foot long dowel from uh, Home Depot or Lowe's or Menards or whatever your home improvement store is. So, you know, roughly six feet long, three quarter of an inch, they're pretty common. I'm um, sorry. And then, oops, oops, second. And then, so the races that don't include armor, what one needs to do to what to, to have to put them on is something like this. I mean, so for the stadio and there's just the, the imagination, like getting people lined up properly, it's astonishing like how amusing people find the race starts to be. I mean, it's a, it's a matter of like how one sells it, but but like the the um, it is so bizarre to have people with their feet so close together and their arms straight out that people tend to get kind of a kick out of it. So just playing that up is one of the ways that um, I have gotten uh, people into this. And then, you know, one might get a staff for the um, Alutas and then like track starting blocks would be one way for, to, to simulate the, the Bulbis. Um, so if one has access to those things, one could um, do that. And then um, if one wanted to do a Diaulos or Dolicos, um, a, a traffic cone can work just fine for those things. But the the evidence that we have from vases of the Comteres is of something about four feet tall and maybe you know four inches by four inches. So that might be one thing that a person could use and just find a stand for it. Um, and then the for the dole course would need to be another turning post down at the end for people to turn around so going into how these comptades would have been on a course um we have evidence from literature that there were lanes in which individuals would run and they would go around um just 
their own sort of course. They'll go up, they'd go around their comp tier, they'd go around another comp tier and back, and they're just back and forth like this. But we don't actually have archaeological evidence of those things. Um, and so it seems that at least for the Diaulos, at least some of the time, um, people were going around the same um, comp tier, the same turning post. So, um, and which, which makes for some pretty good humor when one has all these people crashing around the same um, turning post at one time, which clearly did happen at some times, just maybe not all the time. So this is what would, would need to make these events work. Any questions? Yes, Kirsten. Um, I hope you didn't say this and I missed it, but how do you determine the starting positions? Because it seems like some people would have an advantage depending on where they were in relation to the comp chair. Um, yeah, it, it seems that um, I, I would imagine, I mean, there's, there's no clear record of this. Um, so as with so much in the ancient world, you know, we just take our best guesses at it. But um, was there an advantage to being like right in the middle as opposed to being on far edges? Yes, there was. And so, and as I tell my students, just life was not freaking fair. <laughs> you know? and, and so this is just like one of the reflections of just life being totally unfair, that, that, that people would have their names most likely chosen from an urn and then uh, they'd be lined up in that way and the people on the outside would have greater glory if they managed to win. But yeah, because there was no staggered start for these races. When we get to the, the chariot races, yes, there was a staggered start, but not for the running races. Anything else? All right. Then the Hoplito Dromos. This is where things start to get kind of fun. So this is a race in armor. And as you can see, we have people with uh, helmets, shields, and then in most cases, uh, so we can see greaves. So we have helmets, shields, and greaves. And so if you have access to helmets, shields, and greaves, this can be pretty fun. And it's not that hard to, to come across these things, it's just a matter of um, uh, having a little bit of cardboard or falling into a, a small sum of money. So um, at, at my school, we, we managed to, to come up with some money that I'll, I'll talk about how you know I got it from different organizations to make shields of different sizes. And then uh, we managed to buy greaves and helmets. So um, people can look like this with their fancy um, brass helmets, like bronze is way more expensive, but, but uh, brass is still expensive, but not nearly as bad. Um, same thing with the greaves, those are brass, bronze would be way more expensive. And then uh, these are uh, Macedonian sized shields. We also have, uh, as you can see behind my head, uh, Corinthian sized shields as well. So three feet across, these are two feet across. So um, we, we cut those in the theater um, uh, prop lab, prop uh, workroom and uh, got some help from people in art to paint those things. So these would be how hopefully the Dromoi, so people running the race would look. And then how they would look when actually running this race is here and I'll, um, so do a share here. Okay, so can you all, can you see uh, another screen now with children on? Okay, so we'll see if, all right. Father Poda. Okay. Heto moi. Abate. Father Poda. All right, so that ends up um, being pretty fun, you know, getting people in um, the the armor and running is is rather amusing, and, and going around the the counter is is kind of a kick. So um, it it can be kind of expensive. So like, how does one do something like this? So what do we need? We need to have helmets, shields, and greaves. And this can be done in different sorts of ways. Like um, here's, over here we have just cardboard. I mean, so cardboard is one of the ways to do it. 
it simulates a shield. It looks like a shield, which is not very heavy, um, or different sizes of these. So we've got the Macedonian size, about two feet for smaller people, or the Corinthian size, about three feet for larger people. These ones are just plywood. And um, so inch thick plywood, I think, which is pretty heavy, um, but it comes close to simulating uh, an ancient Greek shield. And then, and then getting the hardware in the back is its own issue. So that's this, somebody wants to talk to me about how to do that. That's a separate matter, but it's, it's got its own complication, but I've kind of worked um, a, a system out there. Then for, for helmets, also cardboard can be easily worked or there are plastic ones that can be gotten online for 10 or $12, you know, do a search for plastic Greek helmet. Um, or there's another place, I can't remember the name of it, where we've gotten quite a bit of authentic looking and metal actual stuff. And this is like 150 or more, maybe $250, I can't remember. I mean, this is a huge amount of money, but, um, but, but it's also a huge amount of cool. And so um, there, there's really no, no substitute for having like a heavy metal helmet on one's head and trying to run with it. And um, it, it really gives a sense of just the physicality of all of this stuff. And th these things that we bought came with their own little beanies. And so people's heads didn't get quite as beat up. And uh, we had people put uh, little washcloths underneath the beanie so they it wouldn't be too gross. And the next person put the beanie on. Um, and by the way, so here's the, the beanie that, that came with uh, these things. So uh, these are some ways that one can simulate the shield and the helmet and then greaves these ones here are plastic they're really 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 cheap but they still have managed to hold up for quite a few uses over um many years those are like you know ten dollars or something which if you're getting six pairs of them is still 60 bucks but it's way better than these ones um uh, these ones which were uh $180, I think, for each one of them, maybe. So it's it's a lot of money for these things. And they're really uncomfortable also. So we've got um, very expensive, really uncomfortable <laughs> versus far less expensive and uh, far less uncomfortable. So just whatever is your priority. So there's some ways to do that. Any questions about how to get these things or how to do the Hope These Are Dromos? Uh, Bob, Catherine Petrole, if I'm pronouncing that right, has a question about the weight of the armor and she also had a suggestion earlier about 3d printing the uh <laughs> now i can't think of the word the the bulbous <laughs> okay thank so, you i don't know if she wants to jump on but... catherine do you want to jump on hey, yes can you hear me all right i can yes great i had a question um do you ever simulate the weight of those objects to have students think about how that would change the running um and if so you have any idea about how heavy that stuff would be? Um, I have weighed these things before, and um, and I don't know exactly what the weight is, but the, whatever weight is that I came up with was pretty close to the weight that um, the the ancient Olympic things would have been. So we're getting pretty close to simulating the weight of what people actually would have run in, and. Um, so the, it's three quarter inch uh, plywood for the shields. And so if you get three feet diameter of three quarter inch plywood, whatever that weight is, is fairly close to what uh, it was in ancient Greece when people were running these things. And so th there's that. The helmet is, the helmets and the greaves are brass rather than bronze. Um, the weight is not radically different between those things, and I, I, I have not weighed them, so I don't know exactly what they weigh, but this is one of the things, one of the reasons that one buys things like this is to, to, to immerse people in the physicality of the ancient world, and there's, there's, there's really no better way to, to sort of project oneself into a place than to sort of feel it physically, you know, see things, feel them, heft them. So, and you know, when, when people run with these things in my classes and at Classics Day, uh, it really gives an impression of just how heavy it is to run around and stuff like this and how totally unwieldy it all is and how painful it all is. Um, yeah, does that answer your question? 
Yeah, thanks. I just, um, I really applaud the, the thinking of the sensory aspect of this. And I think that makes it all more relatable for students. And um, I think it makes it not so foreign to be running with these things. And it makes, it, it might make them rethink, you know, that people actually did this. So I think that's really, really interesting. Yeah, and we use this stuff in classes as much as possible. I mean, it's it, like these things don't always apply, but whenever they do, of course, we're, we're bringing this stuff out. We've got a whole bunch of other garbage too that we've um, been able to acquire through various grants through the years. Thank you. And did you have an idea about 3D printing um, a bulb this? Yeah, I was, I was wondering um, if Monmouth has a 3D printing lab or something that could be possible to do it as a cheaper and lighter version just to get the sense of it. Um, I'm, I'm in Nashville kind of near Vanderbilt and I know they have a, a they have some 3D things there. So just kind yeah. of to think ahead if that's a possibility. That's a good idea. I hadn't thought about that. Um, so it, it'd be, have to, 3D, it'd have to be a pretty big 3D print, but I bet that could happen. And that, that's a great idea, actually. Thank you. Because um, that, that would be at least giving us more of a, uh, a sense of the physicality of it, even if not the weight. So thanks. Any other questions before I move on? All right. Uh, thank you. So then in 708 BCE, we introduced the first multi uh, event competition, which is the pentathlon. And so we don't know how this was scored, um, but it seems that the order was this, the discus, long jump, javelin, stayed in wrestling. Although even that it is, uh, there is a lot from the ancient world that we just can't tell for certain. And, and, uh, but it seems like the best guess is that this is the order that um, there was and then plenty of good reason for thinking that. And I'll talk about each of these things individually, how they were done, and um, how one might simulate them in the, the modern world. So first of all, we have the, the discus. Um, and so these in the ancient world would have been made of bronze, marble, or lead, somewhere between 7 and 14 inches in diameter, about half a centimeter thick, so really, really thin, and weighing between um, like 3 and 14 pounds with with uh, about nine pounds being the, the average. So what can stand in for something like that is uh, a high school practice discus. So this is nine inches in diameter, which is just about ancient size. So that one right there. So this is rubber, it doesn't cause too much damage or one can get a bunch of inexpensive Frisbees and um, it's kind of important to cover them over because they don't fly right if one throws them as a discus. So um, I, I stuffed them with, with a newspaper and then put a whole bunch of duct tape around there in order to this bronze duct tape so to make it look like it's really authentic. Um, and then also uh, one can do just uh, paper plates. You know, one might uh, staple them together and maybe put something in the, the middle of them. But um, the, the closest simulation of the, the size is these over here. They cost about $20 a piece, um, but uh, these are far easier to hold, the, the um, Frisbees with the, the newspaper and the inside and then the duct tape around the outside. So these are things that can stand in for discus if a person is trying to teach people how to do these and do this and show them um, how it would have felt. And so then how to throw it. And I am going to see, I'm gonna stop screen sharing so I can demonstrate this and I'm going to, um, I guess, pin myself. So I am in my office because it had the, the best internet connection that I could confirm. Um, and it's where I spend all my time. So this is roughly how a discus, throwing a discus would look. So if you're my target, if, if over here you're my target, so I'm looking like this, I'm gonna move this down a little bit. 
Um, so if you were looking at my feet, which you cannot see, you would see that they are both pointed in the direction of my target over here. I've got my feet about shoulder width apart, maybe a little wider than that. I've got my hand pointed at my target. Um, the ancient discus did not involve any spinning. I mean, it didn't involve like um, any movement of any uh, flipping around, I should say, no twirling in a circle. So there was just a three quarter spin, something like this. So I start like this, I'm pointing toward my target and then I spin around. If you're watching my feet, you would see that now my toes are pointed away from my target, okay? And I've got my, my front foot um, is up on its toe. I mean, it's the, 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 the foot that's closer to the target is up on its toe. And so you'll see that I've got the discus now pointed at the target, but behind me, then I use um, my front arm to help pull me through. And then I release the discus like this. And one thing that I've learned about discus is that releasing it off of the, the um, forefingers, the way to do it. When I, when I initially started throwing this, I released it off the, my pinky finger, which is not the way it's done. Okay, so um, release it off the forefinger so that the spin is like this. Okay, so this is how the discus was from the ancient world. Again, no like triple spin as there is in the modern discus. And uh, a reason for this may have been that uh, there had to be greater accuracy in the, the ancient discus than in the modern. We don't know the exact rules, but um, uh, it seems to, to have needed to be closer to a spot than in the, the modern disc. Okay, and so I'm going to go back to sharing. All right, and so then I'm going to share my son Alex uh, carrying this out. Okay, can we see um, Alex on our green lawn? Okay, so here he is. I will have Alex pull it all together. So he's gonna get into his proper throwing stance. And now he will throw it. I will have Alex. So Alex is a little bit um, less precise in his footwork than uh, I think ancient discus throwers were. He should have had his feet pointed more this way. Whoops, I guess you can't see there. Um, he should have had his feet pointed more toward this way toward his target. His toe was pointed toward his target more. Um, he should have brought his hand back more so that it was pointed more toward his target when he was circling back for his spin. Um, but he was only 11 at the time. You gotta give the kid a break. And, and uh, his coach wasn't uh, uh, tough enough on him. So this is how the, the discus would have gone. Just that, that no multi-spin, just the, the single sort of twirl. Um, and then uh, one's feet stay on the ground the whole time. One doesn't uh, leave one's feet to spin around. Any questions about discus operation? All right. Okay. And then the long jump, this is another one of these events um, that along with the, the javelin has produced a lot of scholarship and trying to figure out how it would have been done. If you look at the, the leaper here, you can see that this leaper is holding something and these are haltades. And for those of you to whom haltades are uh, old news, then this you know, is, is no big deal, but to those of you who have not studied the ancient long jump, you might be wondering, why would a person carry weights when trying to long jump? And isn't this going to be really awkward? And the answer is, um, it is really awkward. And why would a person hold weights? This is an ongoing question. Um, so we have these weights that we see all the time. So these weights that were uh, made of lead, iron, and stone, and they were between uh, two and 10 pounds each. So this is a, you know, a fairly significant amount of weight that people are carrying around with these things. And 
So, but yet we have a long jump record from the ancient world of about 55 feet from Phaeolos of Croton. And so there's a possibility that um, this was just a super human being who could, you know, jump this far and like twice the athlete of the greatest jumpers of the contemporary period, even roided out contemporary period. Um, or there's something that was being done with this long jump that is uh, different than the standard long jump that we do right now. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how it might have been done. But first, I'm going to talk about how to simulate Haltades, because this is one of the things that, that makes it fun to do the, the ancient long jump with um, students or people at an outreach event. So one can either like 3D print these, which is a pretty cool thing to do. Um, I haven't done that yet. Um, it could probably be done in like ceramics, but then they'd break. So anyway, th this is one way it could be done. Um, or uh, these sorts of hand weights are not that terribly expensive. So one can get a bunch of them. Uh, I got a set that went had weights as little as one pound and then up to five pounds, I think. And so this works because in a given class, a, a person might have different uh, sort of strengths of, of students that might want to have different weights of these things. So I've used these. Uh, you'll notice that there are little marks of paint on here. Um, it's because I, I spray painted another group of these with bronze spray paint and they never stopped being sticky and I don't know why. And I, I think it may be that they're, they're, I, I didn't sand down the surface um, and so it didn't really stick particularly well. So I have another set of these that continue to shed sticky paint every time I use them, including when uh, other um, halteres are placed against them. So this is one way to do things. Another is with just weights from a regular weight set. They've got the little convenient circle that can be held onto. Um, or the first ones I used were scrub brushes and I, I taped weights to the scrub brushes. That was one of the ways to simulate halteres. But um, you know, we're still trying to, to, to go the full ancient with halteres. I mean, this is the best we have is the, um, the, the hand weights right now. All right. So, but these are key. The key is the halteres because everything else about the stand, the ancient long jump uh, is not nearly as cool if you take away having to carry around these weights. So how could the ancient long jump have been done with these weights? One sees an incredible amount of, of uh, images of this that just don't add up. You know, so, so like I, I've myself tried to do um, long jump with weights where I run as this person does it, you know, or this person appears to be doing it. And it is really, really difficult to then get the weights together and jump. And so what we have here is a simulation of long jump from the ancient world based on uh, different depictions we have seen of jumpers at various stages of their leap. And you know, I, I, I'm at a school that has some pretty good athletes. I mean, we've had a lot of national track champions and you know, we're, we're regularly in the, like the top 10 in the nation in track. And I get a lot of these people in my classes, they can't do this, you know? And so how this could have been done I have not been able to figure out. So if you have some super athlete who can do a jump like this, you know, starting off with 10 pound weights, doing some running steps, bring these weights together and then getting feet together and holding things like this in the air and then ending in a, a, a two footed landing, you have better athletes than I have around here. Um, so, so how could this have been done? I mean, is this how it was done? Uh, I don't know. I mean, it, it looks sort of like vases suggested. I mean, here we have this guy up here like this. We have this person stepping. This person appears to be running. We also have evidence of uh, um, a flute being played. You know, you can see here, we've got a flute being played. Why would you need a flute being played if somebody were not running? You know, th there's, there's this idea that like even now, if one goes to a track meet, um, there will be, like people along the long jump and triple jump pit, like clapping sort of in time as, as runners are going up because there's a sort of rhythmicness that comes with the with a, a jump. Um, and so the music seems to suggest that there was some movement leading into the jump that was not just a standing jump. 
but how does one do this and make it work? It's really hard. When I've had pretty good athletes um, do jumps with a little bit of a run and then, or from a standstill, they end up going about the same distance from a standstill and from uh, the little bit of a run. And so, I mean, it's not like it's a, it's a tremendous um, setback to, to do the, the running thing, but it doesn't seem like there's much of an advantage to it. And it certainly doesn't seem like people could jump suddenly like markedly further than anybody that, that I'm aware of who's able to do these things. So um, there are various theories about what could have been the, the way the long jump actually worked. I mean, so how do we get 55 feet out of something like this? Um, the way that it makes most sense to do it is just a standing long jump. So one like, you know, moves the weights back and forth and then, you know, flings forward at one time. And, and then there's a big jump, okay? So then maybe we add some of those together. Maybe we do it five times and we add them all together and we get 55 feet. Or maybe there was five consecutive jumps. You know, maybe this is you know, along the lines of the logic of the pentathlon. We get five events in the pentathlon, five jumps. You know, so maybe this is it. We have no real evidence of this though. It's just people speculating as to what must make sense. Or maybe it was like a modern triple jump because 60 feet is roughly what the modern triple jump record is. And so maybe the thought was that maybe it was sort of a hop, skip and a jump thing. But even with very good athletes, I put two weights in their hands and have them try to do triple jump and they don't go anywhere close to 55 feet, I can assure you. So um, how was this done? There are, there's a huge bibliography on my handout of like people trying to explain how the long jump could have been. And it's really tough to figure this out. So anyway, I had uh, my um, now 15 year old son who is not one of these great athletes that, <laughs> that, that I have um, at uh, Monmouth College um, trying to do this. And so I'm gonna show you how he did various parts of this. So here's a, a standing long jump and how it might look. And I'll share the screen again. Okay, so here is Ben doing a standing long jump without throwing weights back. So let's see how this looks. Here is Ben doing a standing long jump without throwing the weights. Here is Ben doing a standing long jump. You might have noted that that was a bit short of 55 feet. So um, uh, then the... There's been another theory is that, that the weights were thrown back at some point. And we have some evidence of, of that, at least some of the time. And so uh, you can't see my son again with the long jumps, with the weights, can you? No? Okay, so I got it manually shared again. All right. All right, so here he is throwing weights back with the standing long jump. Here is Ben doing a standing long jump and throwing the weights over his shoulders. All right. Here is Ben oh. doing a standing long jump. These are ways that it might have been done. And so maybe we have five of those. We, we've, we had a, um, actually I'll get to the five uh, step thing in a moment here. And so other ways, it could be a few step long jump. Okay, so here's how to do a few step long jump. Um, without throwing the weights back. And I'll once again, just share my screen for this. Okay, so here's Ben doing a few steps of long jumping with weights. Here is Ben doing a long jump with a few steps of running and the weights. And again, that was- Here is just a little bit short of 55 total feet. Um, and then here's Ben trying the same thing, but throwing weights back. And share my screen again. Here is Ben doing a short run up to the long jump, then throwing the weights over his shoulders. 
So there's that. Here is Ben doing a short run up to the line. This does not get us again to 55 feet. Um, so would this have been like, could there have been three of these added together? You know, that, that somebody could theoretically, we could imagine, jump like 55 or jump like 18 or so feet with these um, weights if they were really, really athletic and they just got used to doing this. Maybe this is a way to do it. Or here's the triple jump. I'll, I'll uh, illustrate the triple jump without throwing weights back and see how that would look. Okay, here is Alex, who's 11 at the time. Here's Alex doing the triple jump method with weights. Here's Alex doing the triple jump method. Okay, and again, we're you know, just a few feet short of 55 with that leap. And then a few step triple jump. Throwing weights back. Here is Alex doing a triple jump style, throwing the weights after the first jump. Again, here is Alex doing not quite at 55 feet. And then, so one, one uh, effort was made to, to explain this is likely just five consecutive standing long jumps. And there was a, um, a hammer thrower from Germany who uh did this he you know practiced doing five consecutive standing long jumps he was somebody who had um practiced um standing long jumps as part of his training and so eventually did get to 55 feet and so you'll see my son uh, ben who was 15 at the time trying to to do this five consecutive leaps approach here is ben doing the five consecutive standing jumps method. Here is Ben doing. So we have found people who were able to make that um, add up to 55 feet. Um, the problem is that we don't have um, any evidence that this was actually done <laughs> in the ancient world. So. Um, this is what we're trying to do is figure out like how do we piece together the evidence and um, along with what seems to be feasible from uh, contemporary understandings of how uh, physical performance goes. So this is the long jump. Does anybody have questions about this peculiar uh, ancient uh, Olympic event? Is that a hand raise, Katie? Uh, Katie, it, yeah. Hey, sorry, I'm the one with all the questions. But, I'm happy um, to have the questions. So um, these artifacts are completely new to me, and I'm 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 wondering. I might have missed it if you said it, but um, do you know if ones that have been found are they clay or metal, or yeah. are there versions of each? Yeah, we, we have. Um, a ver hold on, let me go back to my notes on this. So so we have them: uh, lead, iron, and then stone. I don't even know what what. Um, type of stone. I, it's just uh, in my own notes, I just have the stone of different sorts. So lead and iron are two of the ways that, that we see them and then just other uh, types of stone that could be fashioned into these things. So yeah, and we have evidence of at least those three from the ancient world. Does that answer your question? Yes, thanks. I have a quick follow up. Um, sure. Do you know um, about any sites that they've been found at? Like, have they been found in athletic contexts or funerary? Or, um, I mean, I'm happy to go do some Googling myself. I'm just wondering if you can direct me to any site names. Um, Nemea is where a lot of stuff has been found. Oh, okay. And so this is, this is one place in which um, Stephen Miller has been located and he's done a great deal of work on uh, this stuff. And so there, there are quite a few artifacts found from Nemea. Um, so if you look, at um, in my bibliography for Miller Ancient Greek Athletics, this is one place to start for an explanation of a whole lot of stuff. And that'll, there'll be citations that'll lead you to many other places to uh, get more precise original research. Good enough? 
Thank you, thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions about the long jump for the moment? Bob, you do have a couple of questions coming in. Jonathan has a question and then Mark, and I have a question too, if no one else sure. has that. Why don't we give um, Mark the question and then we can do other. <laughs> All right, sure. sure. Um, I was just curious why um, it, you had them throwing them over their shoulders. I always thought they threw them behind them like that. Yeah, um, I've, I've seen... propel themselves forward. So I, I have no authority for thinking that. I just, that was how in my mind it happened. Yeah, and why is that? I mean, like this stuff, th this is not my like field of like massive research. I, I do this so I can put on Classics Day and, and you know, do my sports classes. Um, and I believe that I have, I don't even know if we have, I, I'm, I'm trying to recall what the evidence is for that. And it seems that there, do we actually have pictorial evidence of that? Or is it just um, that we have literary evidence of it? And it may be just that there's literary evidence. And so we're just speculating as to which way they would have been thrown. And so with the, the throwing it over the shoulder, there's at least kind of the continual motion um, idea and then, a, the, then a person's body would be propelled forward with it. So if we um, you know, bring the arms forward like this, we keep them going and then over the shoulder. And then that, you know, that, that means that the lower body keeps being propelled forward if we throw it over the shoulder like that. Um, whereas if one throws it behind, it's gotta be like jump like this and then, um, it seems that a person is kind of propelled downward if, if a person's in the air and then throws the weights behind. Um, I know that I've tried it both ways and I haven't found the, the throwing with the throwing them sort of downward to, uh, to work particularly well. But then again, throwing it over the shoulders didn't work particularly well either. <laughs> but, but I cannot remember what the evidence is. I mean, I don't know um, why it is that I, um, have my son do that particular move versus the other. And I think it may be just a lack of pictorial evidence of both, but I may be wrong about that. Yeah, yeah. no, I, I, I kind of think like when you look at the other image um, that you had where the, you show the figures, you can see the, um, you can see, uh, yeah, like uh, where as they're coming down, it looks like they're, the arms are behind them. Uh huh. So that may be that. So that's that, kind of how I had pictured it, but. And it could be that too. I mean, so that, that at the very end of the throw, they do that for the, or the very end of the jump, they do that to, um, to conclude it. So th that is one possibility. Yeah. But I think that it just may be a lack of amphitrial evidence at all. Um, and, and just sort of, you know, guesswork. So that it might be, you know, reasonable guesswork that the throws would be at the end because we do see like um, this guy with the weights there. Um, and then maybe the, the idea is that the person would throw them behind at, at that point. Yeah. So thank you. Yeah, no, there's no way of knowing that. It's like the thumbs up, thumbs down thing. You know, exactly, just... right. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> I think there were other questions too, I think. So my question is kind of related to that. So Jonathan graciously said I could jump in. Um, I was wondering about the throwing of them also. It's, it looks alarming, like it looks like <laughs> dangerous to me. And I was just wondering, cause there's some stories about people getting hit and hurt with a discus and stuff. And if there actually was be, these being thrown, it seems like well, these are 15 pound weights. It seems like is, do you know if there's any evidence of, of injury or anything like that? And, um, and also, uh, I was, oh, sorry, I was also wondering if you had noticeable advantage throwing them over not throwing them. Like it was hard to tell and maybe you address that, but I was just. Uh, really, the, the weights in general, I'm just, and to answer your second question first, the weights in general are so unwieldy that it really just using them at all um, is really difficult. And so th there's no advantage, particularly throwing them versus not throwing them because it's just such a pain to have these things. Um, th there can be a small advantage like that if one is um, 
uh, standing long jumping, there can actually be a small advantage in having the weights. And so this is one of the reasons why contemporary scholars of, of kinesiology have thought that, that maybe it was just five consecutive um, standing long jumps that, that made this work because there can be a small advantage in doing the standing long jump with weights. But in general, weights are really, really unwilling to work with. And so um, like the throwing thing, like when people have done the standing long jumps, they have not thrown them because it has not been advantageous to do so. But most people when just kind of puttering around with this, don't see a whole lot of difference between the value of throwing versus not throwing. And then um, in response to your first question um, about uh, stories of people being hurt by this, uh, no. I mean, just in the same way that we don't have stories about the vast majority of everything that happened in the ancient world, we don't have stories of, of that. We do have stories of people getting hit by javelins and discuses, but we don't have any stories of people getting hit by uh, these weights, probably because they, they would just be showing up right in the wake of a person's jump. And so unless somebody like leaped in at the last moment, like right behind someone when, you know, he was jumping, it's, it would be pretty tough to get um, hit by Haltades. So does that answer your question sort of? Thanks. And then Jonathan, do you have a question? Yeah, the question I have is somehow it, it's related more to the actual movement of the legs. Um, what looks counterintuitive to me is that position of both the legs and the arms out at the same time. And I'm wondering, now I'm not an athlete, so I don't know if someone could easily do that, but it just seems like the movement of the legs, like mid jump forward would be pushing backwards instead of forward. And makes me wonder how much we can actually use that as a reconstruction for that movement. Since there's another one that has the legs folded under, are we supposed to right. take that as before or after or? Well, uh, so, yeah, the question. So this one is supposed to be, you know, shown down here. I mean, so this is the, the idea is that this is early in the leap and the person is just starting to kick the legs out. But in terms of really doing that, it's extremely difficult. And the being in this sort of a, a position, that is um, that is consistent with modern long jump practice. I mean, so if a person watches like the, the best long jumpers in the world, they can get themselves into a position like that. Um, and so, you know, one, I mean, I can't because I'm just not that athletic, but um, but somebody can. I mean, so like my, my thought is that if we put these halteres into the hands of incredible athletes, maybe they could find a way to make that work. But I, I really, I have a hard time believing that, that it would have looked like this still, um, just because these weights are so unwieldy. And if, if we don't have like equivalent weights on people's feet, you know, it's just like the, the, the imbalance of the upper and lower bodies makes it really difficult to to get a person into a position like this, where we have both the, um, the the feet and the hands at the same point, so like, how does that happen? It would it would make much more sense, man. But even with a standing long jump, I mean, this there, there's it's really difficult to see how this would have worked. And um, if we were raised with this and people were doing this all the time, they they could figure out ways to do it, but um, but without being raised with it, this is a challenge to see how it could actually have worked out in, in uh, practice. Any other, does that help? Any, any other, do you want to add to that? Does. Can I have a, I just want to follow up really. Uh, do you think that they perhaps any evidence for practicing the, the long jump by uh, steadying the body on um, maybe bars or something like that to practice moving um, the torso and the and the oh. lower limbs. Man, if it's, it would be interesting to think like if, if one would look back at all sorts of pot paintings and you know and then just sort of like think like wow, wonder if that was like long jump practice. You know, I mean, the, the, but um, to my knowledge, there have not been people who have who have seen 
face paintings like that, you know, that, that, that show people doing something that, that appeared to be practice for learning to align one's body properly for a long jump after being so unbalanced in, in you know, in the running and, and holding the weights that are the different weight from one's feet. So yeah, th there, to my knowledge, there is no pictorial evidence of that sort of a thing happening. People training um, for the long jump other than doing the actual long jump itself. So thank you, good question. Anything else? All right, so thank you. And then one more event that I have, you know, more than that, but one more event that people get a particular kick out of is javelin, the akon, because it includes an ankula, a rap. And then in addition to this being just a cool word to say, so ankula, you know, I mean, students get a kick out of that. So, you know, when I'm teaching all these, these uh, jocks in my sports class, these terms, they, they, they like that. Um, so we always see these wraps on javelins and they do appear to have some benefit. I mean, that, that um, when one wraps a javelin, studies have shown from the ancient world that they are more accurate than um, non-wrapped javelins. So there is a functional benefit to having a wrap around the javelin. And so uh, what does one do if one wants to, to simulate this in the modern world? So one should get a, a dowel. These were about the height of throwers. And in the ancient world, you know, we're talking five foot something. And so one can get like six foot dowels from any home improvement store. They're um, generally poplar when they're sold at these places. So, so six foot uh, long and three quarter inch seems to, to come close to simulating ancient ones. Uh, the athletic ones in the ancient world will, were made of elder wood. Uh, when I came into a pot of money a few years ago, I looked into getting some elder wood and that is extremely expensive and very difficult to find in the lengths that one would need to um, make a javelin. So something that was close to it is hard maple. And uh, so oh, dark maple, I'm sorry. So dark maple is kind of a hard wood like the, the elder wood. So I got some of that, it was like $10 per, um, per uh, dowel. Whereas these things are like, you know, a dollar per dowel or something like that. And so I, I did very precise comparisons of the two and there's effectively no difference, you know, so no difference in the appearance, no difference in the performance. So um, I would highly encourage you if you're going to do the javelin, do not spend $10 per, per dowel on, um, on hard maple, which is supposed to simulate elder wood. Instead, just go with the poplar at Home Depot. And there is a, a a metal tip about two inches long that would be on there. Um, I forged one of these out of aluminum with students a couple summers ago and they broke fairly quickly. We tried to make them out of bronze as well, um, but bronze has a really high melting point and we couldn't get our um, fabricated forge to go up that high. But this is one of the things I'm hoping to do. We, we do have now a, um, a a metal 3D printer that should be able to print something like this. I've just got to get the right uh, formula for doing that. So all one really needs is these things. And then what makes it cool is the onculi. So two ways to do it. One extremely expensive, one way less. So you can either buy ox hide. And so um, this is what we did when I fell into a pot of money. I think it was like $180 for a, a stretch of ox hide. I was able to cut quite a few straps from it. So these are, these, from the ancient world, we have them around 18 inches, 12 to 18 inches. Or one can go with suede um, sort of string that, that comes from uh, Joanne Fabrics or any number of other fabric stores. So one can get for $5, a huge length of it that can be used by a whole bunch of people. So I would highly recommend that. From the ancient world, we see these things either doubled up, these wraps either doubled up or singled on um, from, for throwers. And so the suede stuff is gonna be doubled up, whereas the ox head stuff will be singled just because it's, it's so bulky. And then to wrap it, um, 
is like this. And so we've got, this is picture number one. He is starting with, so this is for a right-handed thrower, starting with the, um, the non-throwing end of the, the Ankula on the opposite side of one from the, the opposite side of the javelin from the thrower. So this is on the outside, away from me as a right-handed thrower. And it's at about a 45 degree angle going toward the front of the, the javelin, the, the throwing end of the javelin and a little bit behind the halfway point. That's number one. Number two is this. So I have moved the, so the, there's the bottom end here. It goes over the, um, the, the near side of the javelin and then um, oh, and here we can have it. So under the new side of the javelin and then going toward the front again. And then I keep wrapping it around. So here's step three. Then I keep wrapping it around, moving up toward the front of the javelin. And so that we're holding, as you can see here, the, the original short end down against the javelin. So first I just keep wrapping it tightly and then moving up toward the front. And there will be then this loop at the end into which the fingers go. The key is to start on the side opposite the javelin thrower, the side of the javelin opposite the javelin thrower, um, so that when eventually it is thrown, the, the spiral will be in the proper way, okay? So when I throw this, this thing is going to spin in this direction, which is the way that it should, okay? So it'll, it'll, um, it won't be fighting against uh, momentum. So this is how it is wrapped. And then here's how it's done with an oxide um, strap. And so I'll share this in just a moment. So here I am. I'm now gonna show how to wrap an ankula around an acone. So the strap around the javelin. So I have my, this is a, a bull hide strap. These would have been between 18 and, and uh, 24 inches in the ancient world. So the first thing we need, if we have just a single layer strap like this, is we need to put a loop in one end. So I'm doing a, a simple knot like this. If I'd remembered my Boy Scout training, I could tell you what kind of knot it is, but I can't. So one that would allow the the rest of the strap to continue to slide through it, but still that is fairly tight. Then I go to the javelin itself. I start my wrap a little um, to the back end of halfway of the javelin. I'm pointing the short end of this toward the front of the javelin at a 45 degree angle there. So from there, I wrap underneath, and then I have the, the longer end again at a 45 degree angle, holding the short end down and holding it in place. And then so between two and five wraps around there is what we're looking for. And then I have my fingers that go into the end of this loop, my, my pointer and middle finger. And then I have my other fingers that hold onto it like that for the throw. I'm not going to show how to. So that is roughly how to wrap these things. Any questions about wrapping um, an ankula around an acon? Questions about wrapping an ankula around an acon? All right. Then how to throw it? So we can see uh, somebody taking clearly steps toward moving into the throw. It's, we don't have a real clear record of how many steps it would have been. Seems like a couple, you know, but we're taking our best guesses. And then, so it appears that the person seems to be squared up against the, the target. So it's marching toward it. And then we also have evidence of people turning to the side before they tossed it. So they have a lot of width in their, um, between their, their two arms uh, and moving sideways before they throw it forward. And so here is, I think my son, Alex, who actually does this throw. All 
it's Mark actually. Has the, the javelin or the acorn in his hand. He has the ankula wrapped around it. He has his two fingers through the loop on the ankula. He has his uh, ring finger and pinky on the javelin itself. And so the, the ring finger and pinky and his thumb are the ones that are really holding the javelin. And then the pointer finger and middle finger are going to be releasing the um, ankula so that we get a good uh, rifling action on the javelin. So Mark will take his two steps forward. He's going to have his arms pretty straight out. Mark, can you get your arms straight out? He's going to take two steps forward and then release it. We don't know exactly how many steps um, we're taking, but it seems that two is a reasonable number. So go ahead, Mark, give it a shot. Has the, the javelin or the acorn? So there is uh, an acorn throw and the uh, the ankula came off of the javelin as you threw that. Okay. Um, and so that's roughly how the javelin worked. Any questions about uh, javelin throws? I have another question, just very simple. The, sure. Does the ankula stay in your hand then? Does it? It is. Uh, it's, I mean, it can either stay in one's hand or kind of fly off at the end, like after a person has gone forward with the motion. Um, so very often it throws, it um, um, comes off like that. Sorry, that was a phone call. Um, so yeah, I mean, sometimes if, uh, sometimes it sticks in people's fingers, but a lot of times it just flies shortly after the, the javelin. Other questions? All right. So now I'll move into combat events, which um, in certain ways are, are quite simple, but um, also quite uh, amusing. So we have Pala, which was introduced in 708, the same time as the pentathlon. So this was both a pentathlon event and an individual event. And there has been some, some uh, different interpretations through the years about whether there were two types of wrestling, whether there was upright wrestling and ground wrestling, but um, Stephen Miller's um, idea is that there was just one type, that, that um, uh, any thoughts about there being ground wrestling separate from upright wrestling was just a misinterpretation of images of Pankration. So we have one type of wrestling which is largely on foot. Like sometimes knees can go down when making a move, but for the most part, we're trying to stay upright. And so we have a lot of engagement like we see these two here. So sh shoulders close together, um, arms outreached, and then we have throws like this um, because um, to, to get a victory in this kind of a wrestling, we had to throw someone to the ground three times and have uh, either back, shoulders, or hip touch the ground. So these are the ways to get a win in Pala. Um, back, shoulders, or hip touching the ground three times. And so grabbing somebody like this is one way to do it. Um, and how would it look? I've got a couple of twins who will illustrate this. Alex and Mark are now demonstrating upright wrestling. So this is wrestling in which they do not go on the ground, they stay on their feet. So can you boys please engage? as upright wrestlers would based on what we see on base paintings. So some sort of engagement like that. They're pushing against one another, they're in contact. With upright wrestling, we need to have three throws leading to a victory. So the, and so Alex is going to throw Mark in a way that would lead to a victory. So go ahead. Okay, and the, the reason that worked there is that Mark's hip and shoulder made contact. So we need um, hip, shoulder, or back making contact for a throw to work. We need three of those for a victory. Alex and Mark are now demonstrating upright wrestling. So um, what could also happen to lead to, uh, to, to falls is tripping, that's okay, but no biting or gouging. Um, and so we can't dig fingers into eyes, mouth, or tender parts of the body. So this is the pala, this is wrestling. Um, questions about Pala. Okay. Then another combat event is the Pukes or Pugmachia, so boxing. So we first see this in 688 BCE. And um, 
rules for this. So we, this is not like modern boxing where people can you know, gather in a corner. It's just, they, they stayed separate from one another. Everybody's thrown into the same weight class. No rounds, we just keep pounding one another. No ring, so we, we, no formal ring. So people could go outside of it, but there was a sense of where they're supposed to be. No biting or gouging again. And it seems that blows happen mostly to the head, although we're gonna see an example uh, in a little bit of uh, low blows. But this was unlike wrestling in that uh, it wasn't a matter of just a certain number of falls. It was knockout, knock senseless, or concession. And the concession comes from, let's see if we have this in the next slide. Um, concession comes from raising a finger. So if one raises a finger, this is a matter of concession. Otherwise, we have knockout or being knocked senseless as the way to achieve a victory. Um, and you can see that these fighters are wearing a wrap around their hands. This again is ox hide. So these are himantes or the, the singular himas. Um, and if we look at these people, the way these people are standing, let me go back here, sorry. Um, if we look at their hands here, so we have the hands up, this guy's arm down this way, but they're kind of out like this. And they've got their hands wrapped. So how did Hamantes get wrapped? I'll show it this. You're marking Alex again. Alex and Mark will now wrap their hands and wrists with Hamantes. So they start with the end of the Himas, of each Himas, in the palm of their hand, and then they wrap it um, up so that it goes over their main knuckles in their hands and then around so that we are uh, protecting the main knuckle so that they're not breaking knuckles and then also they're wrapping it down around their wrists as well because they want to make sure they're stabilizing their wrists so that they don't um, break as, as many bones as they otherwise would if they didn't have that stabilization there. So once again the purpose of the Hamantes are to not break knuckles and not break wrists. I mean, so we're trying to stabilize um, our bones in this way. And um, there is in some ways a little bit of a cushion against somebody's face, but not much of one. And in fact, uh, it's it can be rather cutting against a face to have the edge of the ox hide. So it doesn't seem like it was a lot for the protection of the opposing boxer. Uh, in the same way that, that modern boxing gloves are. I mean, modern boxing gloves protect both the, the, the one throwing the punch and the person receiving the punch. And um, later, around 336 BCE, we start to see knuckle um, guards and heavy leather with sharp edges. So we're actually trying to do more active damage to opponents with our Himantes. So we got that. And a couple of boxing anecdotes that, that students find um, rather amusing typically. Oh, actually, sorry, one more thing I want to talk about is boxers' stances. And so we once again see here these hands raised up high and away from faces. And how much of this is sort of stylistic to show people's faces? How much of this is sort of an exaggeration of what was really done? It's hard to know for certain, but we see so many of the same thing, like hands like this, so that we have more forearms blocking, if anything, but hands above heads, whereas modern boxers are like this. They've got their hands in front of their faces. They're blocking blows with their hands. We see a lot of hands up above heads and forearms being the things that are blocking, but just not a whole lot of facial protection. And so here are Mark and Alex again, illustrating not just that, but also the stances that we see from uh, boxers.
Alex and Mark are demonstrating boxing form as we see it on vases in the ancient world, which may be somewhat stylized. But what we see in the ancient world is straight, stiff legs and arms that are held up to the sides of heads. Uh, modern boxers tend to keep their, their hands more in front of their faces, but ancient boxers uh, tend to hold them more to the side, at least on vases. So um, Mark is going to demonstrate a jab based on what we see on vases. You can see that he has stretched out his, his punching hand and he's brought back his other hand in reaction force. So to get this, the most power on that punch. And then Alex countered. So Mark, go ahead and do a gentle jab again. And then one thing we might see is that Mark's face is completely exposed. This is what we see on vase paintings though. So Alex theoretically could counter and punch him back in the face. Alex and Mark are demonstrating. So this is what uh, we see. So people seem to be fairly uh, prone to being belted in the head. Um, and so we can imagine there's probably a fair amount of that. People just had to toughen up and learn how to, to take a punch. Um, let's see, what am I doing here? And then we've got some anecdotes from the ancient world that are kind of funny. Like one, we have you know somebody clearly hitting below the belt in, in this picture here, even though uh, mostly it was in the head. And then the way that that matches could come to an end was with uh, like if if an, a match had not ended by nightfall, one way that matches could come to an end was with unguarded blows against one another. And so we have an we have an anecdote of um, one boxer named Demoxenes and another named Kreogas fighting one another, and they decide to to, to um, just resolve it with blows to one another's heads that are unguarded. And so Kraugas like punched him and he's in the head, didn't knock him out. And so then, um, so Kraugas is then waiting for the blow to come from uh, Demoxenes. And Demoxenes, instead of hitting him in the head, reached his hand out like this and went um, under Kraugas's ribs and pulled out his intestines. And so that, that kills Kraugas. And so Demoxenes lost on two counts. One was that you cannot kill your opponent. Okay, so this is one reason that one loses. So one, if one kills an opponent, um, th that is a loss. And then another thing is that he was charged with having made four blows instead of one, like each finger with its own separate blow. And so that was, was treated as um, unfair there. So he was booted out of the competition for those two reasons. So that's boxing. Um, questions about boxing before I move to the last combat sport. All right. Then the last combat sport is Pankration, everyone's favorite combat sport, 648 BCE. And people could largely do what they wanted. Um, they could box, they could wrestle, they could go on the ground, they could strangle one another, they could twist arms, butt heads, um, break fingers. Um, they were not supposed to bite or thumb gouge, although it seems that um, that did happen because Alcibiades at some point was was uh, um, doing a pancratio with someone, and someone said, "You know, you you bit me like a little girl," and he said, "No, I didn't. I bit you like a lion." You know, and so so biting did happen, um, even though it wasn't really supposed to, and um, so a lot of things could happen there. Um, and strategies were break fingers. You know, so you want to start breaking the fingers of the opponent. This is a good way to to try to disable the opponent as much as possible. Um, but otherwise, just keep pounding people and, and um, getting them in so much pain that they would concede, just like in boxing with the finger raised. Um, there was a popular move, the stomach throw. So I will illustrate that with um, my kids here. will demonstrate the Pankration and they will work, they'll show in particular one move that was very popular, a stomach throw. So boys, can you engage please? And the way the stomach throw is done is that one person, as Mark did, uses the opponent's momentum against him and falls onto his back as Mark did, puts up his leg, 
um, puts his foot into the opponent's midsection and tosses that opponent over the top, as Mark did. And Alex has raised his finger to indicate concession. All right. Any questions about the Pankration as we conclude the uh, combat section of the Olympics? All right. Deb, is that a um, question? Yes. Sorry. I was just going to point that out to you. Yes. Thanks. Um, yeah, I wondered, so when you do these events at Monmouth, yeah. um, do you do the Pankration with them? Uh, yeah, I mean, we, we keep it under control. Like, um, so usually we'll have um, just people that are in the class demonstrate how it works. And, you know, and then somebody will stomach throw somebody else who knows that that he or she is going to be stomach thrown. And um, yeah, we, we otherwise try to keep, you know, our students hands off of the hand, you know, bodies of <laughs> visitors. Um, but, you know, so we, we demonstrate how these things go. I mean, usually, so we have our posters in which people have explained how these things work. And then um, uh, one thing we haven't done yet is have little video montages, but that's something that we should have like to, to explain how, how this goes. Um, so but we, we have our own willing students who, uh, you know, have to, to be game for getting stomach thrown um, to be, you know, to, to, to be the demonstrators of this stuff, uh, do it just to show how it would work. But uh, yeah, I mean, we, we don't have it fully live. <laughs> Other questions? That's awesome. I'm just wondering because Iowa and wrestling and yeah. Oh, <laughs> yeah, you could get some pretty sweet Pankratia going, I imagine, with uh, some folks there. Yeah, just get a couple of wrestlers together and say, hey, let's do this. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, I'm sure <laughs> it that. It could be bad. Yeah, I can't remember Thanks. who your coach is now, but I'm sure you wouldn't. Is it Brands? Is it one of the Brands Brothers is coaching now? I think so. Okay. I anyway, I'm paying think... as close attention as I should. COVID's okay. kind of made me step away. <laughs> Yeah, he probably wouldn't like this. His wrestler's fingers getting broken too much, but um, no, probably not. <laughs> yeah. All right, and then the last of the things that I'll talk about is um, chariot racing. So we had two versions of these: uh, one from six, the, the four horse chariot, six eighty BCE, and two horse four hundred eight BCE. Um, the four horse chariot would go thirteen to fourteen kilometers, so twelve circuits of the hippodrome, which is you know, a, a longer. Uh, race course then the runners went on the two horse chariot the sunotis was about four or five kilometers so five um or so circuits of it um ways to uh actually the ways that this was set up the setup of the of the chariot racing course as i mentioned earlier unlike the the foot racing course actually did have a stagger and so we had a setup like the prow of a ship, as it was explained. So the, we have chariots at the front and then others going back from there, um, uh, staggered outward. And then the ones that were furthest away from the turning post would start first. As soon as they reached the, the next row, then the next row could start, then the next row could start, the next row could start. So then by the time um, the, the furthest back chariots got to the starting line, they at least had a, a head of steam that would get them closer to the turning post than the ones who were in the middle. All right. And then, so I'm gonna demonstrate how this is again with my children. I only had four of them to work with, so I couldn't make this quite as illustrative as it could have been, but it's a start. All right. Mark, Alex, Ben, and David are now demonstrating the start of Olympic chariot races, where there's a staggered start, and then David, as the last row of horses, starts, of chariot starts galloping forward, and then when he gets to the next row of chariots, then that row starts, and then when that row gets to the further front row of chariots, that's when that row starts also. Mark? All right. So any questions about starting a chariot race in that fashion? Okay, uh, let me get back to this. Then how does one do this? So um, 
when I was at UNC Greensboro, um, the IJCL convention was, you know, included chariot races. And so there were, were lots of high schools around the state that had chariots. And UNCG, I think we just didn't ask. We didn't ask whether insurance would cover this sort of a thing, but what we had schools from around the state bring in their chariots. And I rode on one of these at, at a classics day at UNCG, and it was terrifying. Um, so uh, when I asked about doing this at Monmouth, the answer was, we don't have enough insurance to cover all the people who would be maimed. And so um, we, instead of improvised chariots, um, with, uh, this is an eight, I think, no, six foot dowel, sorry, six foot dowel here, and then four foot dowel um, that are about an inch and a half thick, I think. So we just made a T out of these. We have our, our horses up here and we have our charioteer back here. And then we just use rope to hold in the horses. And um, so a tetrapoan team has, um, has its outside horses as trace horses. They're not actually attached to the axle. And so I'm not gonna show the videos just for the sake of time, but um, if you have your own four horse tetrapone team, um, you could just have the ropes holding them in. So we just have ropes holding in the outside horses and the other two horses hold on to the front there. And then it's a set of charioteer back here and the charioteer can you know, have a stylized whip of some, or some sort to um, make this work. So um, I've got links for uh, videos of improvised sunoras and improvised um, tetrapon, but um, I don't think you need to see them to get the, the idea. So any questions about improvising chariot races without actual horses or wheeled uh, vehicles? I'm just wondering if they always had them side by side like that, rather than like in a stagecoach, you know, front and back was, you know what I'm um, saying? Uh, is everything that I've seen is always horses across. Yeah, I mean, I've never seen on um, the stagecoach style. Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty sure that's just, it's always that way. Other questions? All right, then. I just have a few logistics I want to share. Um, one is I've got to pay some serious credits to a lot of people because um, uh, this does not happen by just one person. So I've had a million people help me along the way. Um, research assistants working out of how different events work, creation of all sorts of equipment, carrying out of the events that we saw here, cutting, sanding, painting, designing, all sorts of things along those lines. Um, and then funding, and this is where the um, things start to get interesting. So I got some money from my school, but I've also gotten it from a lot of other places. And so this is where uh, this presentation actually has some significant value. Um, I'll talk about where money can come from. So I got it from my school, of course, um, CAMWIS promotion, C Committee for the Promotion of Latin and Greek. I'll talk about this in a moment. Um, I also got some from the Illinois Humanities Council. That was more of a hassle because it's a, a state organization. So um, there's just more bureaucracy to go through, but they actually paid out pretty nicely, a couple thousand dollars. Um, ACL helped me out, but that was when it was an organization feeling flush because it had just started uh, um, an endowment. And so um, I'm not sure how willing they'd be to help out again. SCS, I'll talk about them in a moment. And then local banks have also helped me out. So um, where you can go for your own money. So here's my bibliography, which is also in the handout. Um, where you could go for yours, the easiest place to go um, and, and most likely to get uh, a nice start is CAMWIS Committee for the Promotion of Latin and Greek. So they have grants from between 50 and $500. Um, I'm actually on this committee. I, I don't know what our budget is, but um, if people have interesting sounding projects, they don't get turned down. I mean, so it's, there's plenty of money to go around. Um, it's only if people aren't really doing something that's particularly classical um, that, that we're uh, prone not to accept their um, ideas. Um, and and th there's really no application season. Whenever you get around to it, send it in and we'll deal with it. Um, Classics Everywhere grants. These are, these are more generous uh, in individual grants than um, CPLG, um, but also a little bit tougher to get. Um, so up to $2,000, 
Um, I got 1,000 from them, which is very nice. I appreciate it. Um, there are separate deadlines for these ones. So I, I think it's around February 15th, May 15th, and October 15th. Um, I, I'm, it, it may be different year by year, but it is still going. You know, I just was at a, a meeting for it yesterday. So this is one other place to ask for money. Um, if you're in the K-12 world, um, E. TC grants, excellence through classics grants can be something that you can um, get your hands on, but they don't appear to be available to people in the world of higher ed. Um, as I mentioned, I got some money from ACL a few years ago, but that was just through a personal connection. And I think that they were, just, they were feeling fairly flush at a, a particular time just because of um, some fundraising goals they'd met. So that is what I have to share. Uh, does anybody have questions about raising money or about things that are brought up along the way, how things are done, how to, uh, what materials to use, et cetera? Bob, I'll uh, mention that much earlier, James had asked a very important question, and that is, is the recording of this going to be made available? My understanding is yes. So that, that is what, so Jonathan can confirm that, but my understanding is that yes, this is being recorded and that it will be available. Um, if Jonathan is, I'm not sure if, if Jonathan's uh, in the room right now, but if he is, um, can you answer questions about recording, Jonathan? So unfortunately, all I know is that we are recording right now and that from what I know, there are plans on, at a later date with presenter permission to then make that available somehow, but I don't know the specifics. Okay. I, I believe that I pre-established my willingness to have this at least recorded. Maybe I have to be asked again whether I'm willing to have it. Maybe that's it. Maybe I have to be asked again in case this has been a total disaster, didn't want it to go out. But, but, but when, I am asked again, I will say sure. So I, I hope that this will be available for others, but certainly that the PowerPoint and the, the handout are available. Any other questions? Katie has another question. Uh, if she's ready for it, she said she's trying to think of phrasing. <laughs> I don't know if she needs a minute or if someone else has a question. Uh, I have a question if we're waiting. Um, so Robert, tell me, there are two and a half people in your department. How do that, you find time to do this? Um, it is a matter of uh, prioritization and no longer two and a half because uh, our school has cut some some faculty and so um, so now it, it will be two. Um, uh, it is a matter of prioritization. If you will note what I said earlier about uh, my dean saying very candidly, no one wants classics, <laughs> but but every time somebody comes after us, we bat them away, you know. And so um, uh, there are really a lot of advantages of being where I am. And you know, there's a tremendous amount of freedom. Like I make up classes at whatever I would like. Um, it's we've got there's money for doing various things. You know, most of the time. Um, but you know, we've got to keep justifying ourselves. And so this is one of the ways that we keep doing it. There's not an expectation that that we're going to publish a ton. You know, I'm, I'm trying to, but but that I, I don't need to keep churning out um, articles and books. You know, I'm doing what I can on the side, but that's just for my own um, wish to share my work. Um, the, you know, it's it just, this is among the things that we can do to maintain interest in our, our program. And so uh, this is extraordinarily time consuming. There's, there's no question. And so, um, uh, and in the time, like after a given classics day, I regularly think like never, ever again. And then, um, you know, but then some time will pass and now I'm doing it every other year as opposed to every year. And so some time will pass and I'll think, all right, I think I can pull it off. And then like th this whole fall, I was thinking, 
I just thought, how can I do it again next year? How can I do it again next year? And then it got to be the end of the semester. And I was thinking, yeah, I think I can make it work. You know, I sort of think about people I'd want to invite in. And, and then in a, at a place like Monmouth, um, we can't have this just a classics department thing. And so it's like a, a great number of people around the campus do it. So it's just kind of exciting to, to bring all sorts of people together. And, you know, the, his, the Asian historian has a, a, a Japanese game stand, you know, the ancient Japanese game stand. And, and one of our um, art props has a 3D printing of ceramic ancient Greek vases stand. And, you know, and um, one of our theater props has face painting of the this sort of medieval Indian and um, Japanese theatrical style. So I just, you know, just kind of get motivated by that sort of stuff. But in terms of how we find the time is just, <laughs> I mean, fortunately we, we don't have to publish a ton. So this is just among the things that we do um, to keep ourselves uh, recognized and, and vital. Thanks, I appreciate it. Yeah, it's kind of our situation here is, you know, you have the tenured faculty and then you have the lecture track faculty. And the uh -huh. lecture track faculty are the ones that don't have to, aren't required to publish anything. So we're the ones that usually do a lot of the outreach. Um, but yeah, even with I think four, five, five of us, we still never find enough time to do all the things we want to do. So thanks. Sure. Yeah, well, this, I mean, this started like what I've done with Classics Day now started much smaller, you know, and like the Olympic stuff. This was like two days of a, a Greek Civ course until, you know, then I we started doing it at Classics Day. And so I learned a little bit more. And then I got this job here and I thought, you know, maybe I'll turn it into a, a class. So so I learned a lot along the way. But I mean, this is this has been, you know, a decade in the making. So it's, uh, you know, but but it started much smaller than um, than this. And then, you know, now that I've done it a few times, um, some of the things are, are set in place and there's a certain amount of momentum. I don't have to, to um, you know, start from scratch the way I did uh, a decade ago. Any other questions? Katie did put her question in chat. Uh, I don't know if she wants to jump on and uh, say it herself, but if not, I'll just read it out. Yeah, um, I mean, I hope you can tell I, I found your your whole talk super interesting. So my question is, um, and I don't have the exact words still, but I'm, I'm trying to think um, and wonder about if there's any narrative or mythological connection to maybe explain some of the purposes or the methods of the game, like if some of this was inspired by stories, you know, that have been written down and shared. Um, that's a great question. Um, the, the inspiration for them, uh, not that I can think of. I mean, like these, these all, it, it, it was never like mythical story first, then event. Um, but, but we have events then show up in mythical stories. And so we have... Um, you know, this, this, this may be completely obvious to you, but in case it's not, so we have um, the funeral games for Patroclus in um, Iliad book 18 or 19 or whatever that can, whatever it is. So, um, so we have these things in which we have several events. I mean, this is pre-Olympics. Well, actually it's not. I mean, so when, when it was written in its final form, the Olympics did exist, but they didn't have any, we're near the number of, of events that um, we see in the funeral games for Patroclus. So, um, we have games show there. We have um, games in the Odyssey. Um, you know, Odysseus has to, you know, the, the um, Phaeacians want to show Odysseus, you know, how special they are. And so they have some games and um, uh, they say, you know, you're kind of old. You probably couldn't hack any of these games. And, and you know, then he shows them that really he's better than all of them at, at everything except running. Um, so we have those. We have um, mythical stories of people throwing oh man so one of our heroes you know killed his grandfather or something with the discus i can't remember what what the exact story was but yeah i mean there are lots of overlaps in mythology of um with these sporting events um and uh, let's see we have castor and and pollux who are wrestlers um so overlaps between sports and mythology are all over the place and so it's 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 um uh yeah, I mean, you know, because 
everybody's doing sports, you know I mean? So it, 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 it just makes sense that people would fit um, sporting events into uh, mythical stories they're telling because they're just, you know, it's a part of life like, you know, right now. Does that answer your question, Katie? I mean, is, is that what you were getting at? To help yeah, out a little. Yeah, thanks. I'm, um, uh, or are there any gods that are tied or responsible for specific games or competitions, or maybe they favor certain ones? Oh, my goodness. Well, let's see. In terms of like Olymp, I mean, all the, the Olympian gods are, um, they, they each are, the various ones of them are tied to different competitions. I mean, like Zeus is the patron of, um, the Olympics and Apollo is the patron of the Delphic Games because we have all these these different Panhellenic games or four different Panhellenic games. Um, Nemea, I think that's Poseidon. So uh, Nemea the... is Zeus and um, a baby, uh, a kid, a little baby, and then the uh, Isthmian is Malicrates. Okay, so hero Malicrates. Anyway. So we've got, oh, and the uh, hero that killed his grandfather with a discus at a yeah. funeral games is Perseus. Okay, Perseus. Okay, thank you. And then the, um, if I can help out a little. Absolutely, um, please. The, um, I think it's Pausanias says that the, um, the pediment at Olympia showing the chariot race between Oinomaios and Pelops is the foundation of the chariot races. Okay. Um, and that Heracles wrestling with the Nemean lion may be inspiration for the wrestling. Uh, okay. But that's maybe. Seem... But that's like weird that it's an animal and not a person. But maybe that's where Alcibiades got the lion thing. I don't know. Yeah, but that's a good idea. It's a good idea. So thank you. Um, Katie, is that is that getting closer to what you were looking for? Yeah, thanks. I, we're just kind of trying to think through some of it. So that really helps. Thank you. You're welcome. And thanks, Deb. Any other questions? Is that another, is that Katie's that your hand raised again? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't want to be the question hog. So if anyone else has one, uh, feel free. But I, I did post it in the chat just so that um, it can be there and I won't forget it. Um, I'm wondering if there's any regional differences or specialties, because um, I think one thing that most people aren't aware of is that it wasn't just Olympics. And so, but I, I personally don't know if there were, you know, highlights of the competition at some of the different um, sites. Maybe you can talk about that a little bit. Uh, that's a great question. And um, the, the short answer is I'm not 100% sure. I mean, like it, the, the um, uh, the Delphic games had a stronger musical bent to them because they were dedicated to Apollo. Um, but in terms of like the athletics there, I'm not sure if, if there was, if certain of the Panhellenic games uh, had certain of their events particularly highlighted. Um, to, as far as I know, like the, the the stadion race was still the big one. I mean, this this is what was was treated as sort of the, the biggie at the Olympics, and as far as I can tell, the others. In the same way that, like, right now, um, you know, there are a million Olympic events, but sort of the the hundred meter dash is still strangely kind of this this focal event of the the whole um, uh, modern Olympics. And it seems like the stadion was kind of held that distinction for a long time. We have individual people that were sort of stars over time. Um, like Milo of Croton was a, a great wrestler, um, but I don't think that there was any particular place where um, like wrestling was the big thing, you know, or any particular place where chariot racing was the big thing. But that's just, just a um, lack of knowledge on my part, so I'm not fully sure. But, but the thing about um, the uh, Delphic Games uh, being more oriented or having a, a bigger emphasis on music than others, I'm, I'm I can feel fairly uh, secure in saying that. Can I ask a really quick question? Go ahead, Kristen. Sorry, Kristen. Well, you just mentioned chariot races and Delphi, and like, how the heck would you do a chariot race at Delphi? So, 
Yeah, and I don't, um, I don't, maybe they didn't have those in Delphi. They do have a stadium. They do have a, a hippodrome. Really? It's very small. Okay, was that, okay, is that, that the one at the very top of the? Yeah, the, it's at the very okay. top and past the theater. Okay, you, all right. You have to be looking for it, and it's oh, no, very no, I mean, so small. I've, I've, all right. So, yeah, like so it looks more like a theater. It looks more like a regular stadium, but okay. I was told at one point that they they could do a few chariot things, which I don't. But could you get the big, like a, and chariots up there? How? <laughs> I think the terracing um, is pretty like because it kind of you know meanders up there. So I think the terracing is okay for it. Um, even like modern cars can get there, honestly. <laughs> Thank you. Um, in terms of other differences too, Katie, um, you can look at like the wreaths that are awarded to the winners as well. Um, because, you know, at the Olympia, uh, Olympic Games, they get the, the olive wreath, but at the Isthmian Games, they get pine. And at the Nemean Games, they get celery. And yeah, so just like fun, like little things there that can also be done. Thanks, Deb. Anything else? Anything else? All right. Well, Kirsten, is the, the chat, I can't see the chat. Is the chat clear? Yeah, you've got a couple of thanks. Very okay. interesting, things like that, but no more questions that I can see. Okay. So. All right. Well, if anybody else has anything, I've, my email is on the um, on the handout. You know, please feel free to contact me. And thank you for sticking with me. This is a long session, so I really appreciate you being with me. This is not <laughs> normally an SDS sort of session, but you know, there's a there was a call for things, and I said, well, I can you know, I can do this thing, so I proposed it, and here I am. <laughs> so see y'all later, Kirsten. Thank you so much for your work here, and Jonathan. Thanks so much for the the tech assistance. I greatly appreciate it. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank Taking you for the panel discussion.